It might be part of the reason why this coil's not working very well, but when I cut the lines, it's spewing out oil. So this coil might be logged with oil. You know, watch out for that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's coming out the bottom too. So nasty, nasty. This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Got some coach drawers today that uh, we need to diagnose. We had another service tech here and he had the top off the charge a couple weeks ago, probably about a month ago to be honest with you. So uh, we're here to try to find the leaks. And then I also noticed that a couple coils are iced up. So we're gonna knock that out too. At the same time, this is an early morning start. We're uh, working on changes in drain pans too. This guy right here, got our first coil. It's got some ice, but we're doing a quick leak check. And uh, the leak detector was kind of going crazy in here. Let's see if we can duplicate it. All right, there we go. Clearly picking something up, so we're gonna get some soap bubbles on this guy. Okay, we got some big blue right here. And uh, we got it right in there. And it looks like it's leaking inside the coil. So we're gonna get this little bit of frost melted right here. We're gonna measure the coil. Um, and then we'll quote to replace a coil and a TXV. Everything else is looking okay, so I don't think we need to go any further than that. So coil and TXV on this one, and we'll mark it coil one, and then we'll move on down the line to the other one. So I was able to get in here, pull the drain pans, change them, and just use a tiny strip of electrical tape to just seal them to that half inch line. But it starts, uh, sits in the half inch. And then the screws for the drain pan, they were coming from the outside in, but I put them from the inside out for the next guy. So this one's good, this one's good. I gotta secure that, uh, vinyl or plastic hose into the side of this coil but yeah much better now we got to the second coil we're not finding anything but we are going to talk to the customer because the txv looks like crap or at least the power head does and the coil itself doesn't look the greatest either so we'll give them a big picture quote give them the option to change this coil if they want to and then now we got to get to the ones over here and this one this one's all iced up pretty bad so we're gonna get it defrosted. We didn't find any leaks in that coil, so we'll get it defrosted, but the coil itself is in really bad shape, so we'll bring it to the customer's attention again. We got pictures of everything too. So this drain isn't clearing, so I've got my tool right here that uh, I've shown before, but we're, I've got two people here, so what we're gonna have to do is take the covers off of every one and then plug them up and blow them out one at a time to clear the drain. We're on the roof now, we're gonna leak check all up here, so we know the system's equalized out. Always hit the low pr or the pressure controls because those are always a very common place for there to be a leak. Just kinda check around in there. Yep. Picking it up in the dual pressure control. Yeah. It's hit and miss, it's very small. Oh, there you go. So you always wanna check your dual pressure controls, and then we're gonna check the rest of the unit. Under the compressor, I've seen them rot out under there. Again, you don't just stop at one leak. You keep going if you can, because more than not, there's multiple leaks. So. kind of checking everything even before I put service gauges on it because we know that the system's equalized out I also see a little bit of oil over here I don't think it's a leak but we'll just check it yeah it's not picking anything up just dust and crap moving around another one of those old compressors I just changed one of these this is an 04 it's gonna kick it's 
pocket here pretty soon probably. These things get massive abuse. I'm not seeing anything else up in here, so we'll leak check the receiver and then the condenser real quick. Condenser right here, typically don't see leaks on this side. You'll see them on the other side if they are there. But I'm not picking anything up, so we'll check the other side now. And it's not looking like anything in here. You'd think you'd see oil or something. Uh, receiver is in decent shape. Don't see anything major with that. You always want to look at the valves. The valves typically get messed up. But I'm not seeing anything. So we're looking pretty good. All right, I'm gonna put this guy back together and start it up and then check the liquid level in the receiver. All right, we're currently pumping the system down. I'm gonna go ahead and pull my prop out. So what we did was we closed, we front seated the valve on the receiver and that stops the flow of refrigerant coming out of the receiver but the compressor continues to pump until the low pressure control cuts it out. So the flow stops out of the receiver, coming out of the receiver, goes through the dryer to the expansion valve and or expansion valves plural um, but because there's no flow coming out of it the system is basically running out of refrigerant in air quotes uh, but it still has refrigerant but it's just stopped so now it's sitting there at 4 psi if we needed to do evaporative coil repairs or any repairs on the low side we could do them now because it's stopped at that valve but what we're doing here is we're going to check the liquid level in the receiver so we're going to take a heat producing device warm up the receiver and find the spot where the temperature changes on the receiver and that's gonna be the current liquid level. When we run our fingers up here, sometimes I'll do a thermal camera too, but not this time, but when we run our fingers up here, the temperature change happens right here. So our liquid level's right here and we last left it up here. So obviously we're low. So we're gonna add some refrigerant until the liquid level gets up to where the three quarter mark is. We're checking the charge and this unit has, or this system has a head pressure control valve. In fact, every one of these have head pressure control valves. Therefore, they take extra refrigerant because the head pressure control valve floods the condenser in low ambient conditions to try to maintain a pressure differential, keep the head pressure up, easiest way, okay? In order to flood the condenser, you need extra refrigerant in the system, okay? Uh, more so than just a clear sight glass. If this system did not have a head pressure control valve, we could add refrigerant until the sight glass is clear once the box gets close to being down to temperature and it would be charged appropriately assuming everything else is working correctly, okay? But because we have a head pressure control valve, we have to add that extra flooded charge. So, you can talk to the manufacturer. The manufacturer of this box actually publishes the data and tells you how much refrigerant this system takes with the flooded charge in consideration, okay? But, here's the problem. We are topping off the charge on this system. The sight glass was not flashing when I got here. I just know that it has a leak. So it's only leaked out some of the flooded charge, but it's not showing any signs of a refrigerant leak. I marked the liquid level the last time that we worked on the system. So therefore, I was able to pump it down and check the liquid level and see that we were below the level that it was last time. Therefore, that's the amount of refrigerant it's low. If we calculate the charge using Sporland's 90-30-1, that would be the second best way besides talking to the manufacturer, but that's not practical because Sporland's method wouldn't, we wouldn't know how much refrigerant has leaked out at this point right now because we're not flashing, okay? We're not showing any signs of being short at the moment. So the only way that I've come up to be able to do this is to mark the liquid level after I'm done with the repair, okay? So we mark it at the three quarter mark. Now, adding to the three quarter mark or filling it up to 80%, that's the maximum amount of refrigerant you can safely put in the system, theoretically is too much gas. The system will operate, but it's technically gas that the system doesn't need because that extra refrigerant potentially will never be used, okay? Past the point of the calculated charge. And for example, I will give you this. This is their beer walk-in. I did a repair on this and I marked the liquid level at the three quarter mark and I wrote on there 36 pounds of gas, okay? So to get it up to the three quarter mark, I added 36 pounds of gas. But using Sporland's method 90-30-1 or leaning on the manufacturer, if we come over here, the system only needs 25 pounds of gas, okay? So you understand, in order to fill it up to the three quarter level, we added an extra 11 pounds of gas technically doesn't need it, but it's the only way in the field that we can do it. Now, if we were to do a repair, recover all the charge and weigh in the factory recommended charge, then we could mark the liquid level and know from that point forward 
that that's the right amount but in the field you don't always get the option to do that because you're making a quick repair you're topping off the charge and the only other way is to fill it up to the three quarter mark which is the absolute maximum amount of refrigerant you can safely put in the system when it's pumped down okay hopefully that makes sense i get a lot of people saying you know don't do that but unfortunately there's no other way to do it without recovering the charge right so it's uh, super early in the morning we're going to change out all these coils so what i do is take all the drawers out so that way they start calling and then i'm going to go upstairs and we're going to pump the system down so we're just pumping it down change all the evaporator coils and txvs still dark outside 99 percent of the time i'm the first person to get to these jobs i usually schedule everybody like this time i scheduled everybody at 6 a.m and uh, I have two other guys coming. And I usually get here around 5, 5.30. Just gives me time to get everything ready and stuff. So we're gonna open this guy up and get a pump down. Now originally, I was gonna change a suction line service valve on this guy too. In all honesty, I forgot about the suction line service valve. So we may or may not change it. This one right here. I might have one in my van, I might not. So we're gonna have to see, but we're just watching this guy pump down the suction pressure is going to continue to drop and once it gets down to zero or close to zero we'll turn the system off take the low side hose off so the system can have a pressure relief while we're brazing downstairs so you can see that the refrigerant the flow is stopping and we're slowly pumping down you see the low side is dropping 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 i have a screwdriver right here to bypass the pressure control the low pressure control so that way I can pump it down to about four or five PSI without it shutting off. Ooh, it looks like we might be overcharged on this, guys, because you see how high this head pressure is coming? Someone else has been here adding gas to this, and I have a feeling we put too much in it. We'll have to deal with that in a little while. All right, so we're running, we're running, we're running. And I say right about here is where I'm going to stop it. I pulled the pressure control out. And then what we're going to do is just take this low side hose and just let it bleed to atmosphere. That is a de minimis loss. We're just going to let that bleed to atmosphere. And then uh, we'll go downstairs and start doing what we're doing. And uh, because this guy looks, you shouldn't be coming up to 400 PSI when it's pumping down. So I might send a technician up here, one of my guys, to recover the charge. That way we can just uh, make sure that we don't overcharge it when we're all done. Okay, we got four coils, four TXVs. Got those guys right there, so. Going to town trying to get them out. The first step is get them ripped out and then we'll figure out the piping because on some of these, this one right here, the TXV I have is different, so we're gonna hope we can make it work. So I got my coil mounted in there and then uh, the top suction line coming out of the coil fit right back onto the coil but I did have to cut the liquid line right at that T, so I'm just gonna make a piece real quick with the bender. Going right down to the TXV, we're gonna sweat that one in and then jump onto the next one. Next one's gonna be a little more difficult, but we'll get it figured out. Got too much going on to actually show all my work today because we're trying to knock this thing out, but I just bent a couple pieces going up and in. It's all sweat in. We're gonna mount the sensing bulb and then move on to the next one, and then we got two more going down there. It might be part of the reason why this coil's not working very well, but when I cut the lines, it's spewing out oil. So this coil might be logged with oil. You know, watch out for that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's coming out the bottom too. So nasty, nasty. All right, we got this coil in. We got that coil in over there. That one was a little funky on the top, but whatever, it's all good. It's just the uh, the copper line up top was like bent kind of funny, but it's all good. We'll straighten it out. And then that one over there is already done. So we're assembling these. We got to turn on the fan motors, make sure nothing's hitting. And then we gotta go upstairs, change the dryer, and vacuum everything down. Sometimes I get lucky. Um, I've got uh, rotor lock valves here, so I usually keep an assortment of them because we go through them. I think that's the one that I need. That's a, oh, that's a 5 8 No, I think I need a half inch. Are they, oh, they might be all 5 8 Well, I can always bush it down if I need to. Um, yeah. I think it is that one so i'll just take a bushing if i have to so i actually lucked out because this is 5 8 and that's 5 8 that one's a flare so we're going to eliminate the flare brought a piece of 5 8 pipe you can just unsweat it from here make a new piece all the way down into the the fitting 
Had to get my big boy wrenches because we got to get those guys off now. Yeah, this service valve is not happening. Okay, so here's my logic here. I've tried a bunch of different wrenches and I can go get a breaker bar, but if you look down in here, it's starting to stress the rotolock fitting coming out of the compressor. I, it's gonna, it's gonna crack something is what it's gonna do. So this compressor is a 2004. I'm telling you, it's gonna be replaced here soon. It's gonna go out. So we'll change that valve when it goes out, but you gotta know when to call it. I've already tried heating it up. I got my torch right here. I tried heating it up. It didn't break free. And again, you have to be careful because I can keep going and getting it cherry hot, but what happens if I melt the gasket inside and I still can't get it off. You know, you have to know when to call it and say, hey, enough is enough. So we're not gonna try to change that valve anymore. We're just gonna jump onto the dryer. We'll change that valve when we change a compressor. All right, got my spoiling catch all and see all dryer and sight glass installed. As usual, I go with the flare, dryer, male, female sight glass. So I haven't pulled the evacuation. That's why it shows moisture in there right now. So we're gonna get all the vacuum crap hooked up, get it sucking down and uh, hopefully be on our way soon. Uh, when you're doing the evacuation as much as possible, you wanna put all the caps on. So I put the cap on the suction service valve and the liquid line king valve back there. It's currently at about 1500 microns back there. It's a little hard to see. 1523, 1507. So we're just gonna let it run and we're just kind of cleaning up on the roof. I'll start putting some tools away and stuff, trying to be as efficient as possible. Still pulling down. Um, I, this is, this is kind of monumental. I swear that nylog lasts forever. I rarely ever use it because all I use it on is flare nuts. I finally just went through a thing of nylog and I kid you not, I've had this for at least a year um, because you only use a drop, you know? And honestly, if I really wanted to stretch it, there's still a little bit down in there. It's just harder to get it out is all. If I stored it upside down, I'd probably get some more use out of it, but I don't want to do that. So I've got a new container and uh, this is, and this shows you how old I have not used a nylog with the new glue style top. And I know that's been around for a long time because I've been going through old school bottles of it. So, all right, well, this guy's still running. We're at about a thousand microns right now. One thousand one or something. So uh, we are gonna try to reuse the existing refrigerant. We ended up, so when I first started this morning, I pumped the system down, but because uh, it was going really high on head pressure when I was pumping it down. I assumed that I had a service tech here recently topping off the charge and he over slightly overcharged the system. So I went ahead and recovered all the gas out. This will make the evacuation go smoother because we can pull from both sides and we'll go ahead and make sure that we put the right amount back in there and we'll mark the liquid line receiver with a big paint marker. That way everybody knows not to overfill it. So I went ahead and pulled the vacuum. I front seated the king valve on the receiver and I dumped as much gas as the system would take. It took about five pounds. And now I'm gonna have to turn it on and start adding gas as we're going. All right, we are running. So we're just adding refrigerant slowly on the low side. That thing is, is really under a load right now because uh, those TXVs are probably all wide open. The box is like 75, 80 degrees. So sight glass is going crazy. So we're just adding gas. We're gonna uh, clear the sight glass, then we're gonna fill the receiver up to the three-quarter level. So we're, we're adding gas slowly, but this guy's really starting to struggle. You can tell it's got a lot of liquid refrigerant coming back to it. The compressor itself has kind of got a, it's, the whole body's sweating. It's got a really strong vibration to it. So we're just letting the system kind of stabilize out before I add any more gas, just being cautious. Put all the drawers on, letting it bring it down to temp. What's happening, is because it's hot in that box, every TXV is wide open and it's just coming back, you know? So we gotta give it some time. So my sight glass just cleared, but I wanna make sure that this thing has a head pressure control valve because I've seen some of them where people have bypassed them and we just wanna be 100% sure before we add a bunch of extra gas. Yeah, okay, cool. We still have a head pressure control valve right here. So we do need to make sure that we charge it accordingly. So we'll put that cover back on and we'll keep going and we'll, uh, so again, you can do the, the Sporlin 90-30-1 method. You could measure the condenser, calculate the internal velocity or internal uh, volume of the condenser, figure out how much you wanna fill it up for your ambience, and then go from there. Um, we're just gonna take the easiest route. We're gonna fill the receiver up to the three quarter mark and pump it down and check the liquid level. So when my sight glass cleared, my liquid level is about halfway. 
see it right there. So we still need to add a little bit more gas. We want to get that up to the three quarter mark, another inch or two. That way we know we have the maximum amount of refrigerant in it that we can safely put into the system. Now I've shown this before, but I'm going to cheat because I'm going to go ahead and push the pressure control and manually turn it on and then just add refrigerant into the low side very carefully and the system still pumped down. Then we don't have to wait for it to pump down. But you want to be cautious doing that. You don't want to flood out the compressor. You don't want to overheat the compressor. So see, we're still hooked up right there and we're just adding refrigerant. All right. We can clearly see where my liquid level is now. So that's right about the three quarter mark. We've got some marks right there. I'm pretty happy with that. So we're gonna leave it be and we're gonna go ahead and turn the system on and let it run full blast. So this was actually started probably two months ago, maybe three months ago. And then the repair was done like a month later. Um, and the big picture quote was accepted this time. Okay, so even though only two of the evaporator coils were leaking. I talked to the customer and I said, hey, this equipment is in horrible shape. You know, the other two evaporator coils are just as bad, but they're just not leaking yet. I showed the expansion valves, you know, and I said, you know, best scenario here, we replace all four coils. We'd be done with it. We knock it out. Sometimes they accept it. Sometimes they don't. This time they were like, yeah, let's just go ahead and do that. Eliminate the problem. Okay. So we went ahead and replaced all four evaporator coils. Um, as you're doing the repairs, you really got to take your time and pay attention to what's going on. You saw that that coil had a bunch of oil when I was cutting it out. Um, this particular system, there's not really a solution for that in this scenario that is economical, okay? Of course, the reason why we have trapped oil in an evaporator coil is usually because of poor piping practices, okay? And in this situation, that is the case, okay? Um, these uh, reaching cooler, cook drawers, different stuff like that, oftentimes because of the, the size of the boxes and the units, they can't always follow every proper, proper piping practice. And especially when you go to individual coils like this, um, you know, it's hard to get the proper velocity through the system and it just becomes a problem. And you have oil logged coils. That's something that is just part of the game when it comes to these small multiplexed reach and coolers. It just happens. Okay. Of course there's things you could do, but the customer doesn't want to pay that much money. Okay. So, um, whenever you start to have evaporative coils that are not efficient, you know, what's the sign of an oil logged coil? Well, in a system like this, um, you would do temperature checks across the evaporator coils. We have four evaporator coils. We would go in there and check the temps, see what the temperature differential from return to supply is across the box. It's almost impossible to measure evaporator superheat each coil. It just doesn't happen because you can't get in there, the panels, you can't get probes back there. You know, so you just kind of got to work off of your temperature differential. Uh, you can, of course, look at the the, the um, evaporator coils when they're operating with thermal imaging cameras, but that's not going to tell you a lot because, you know, you'd have to take the cover off and it would bypass the air and stuff. So you just start paying attention to TDs. So that's a, you know, whenever we have issues with these boxes, the first thing I do if we're having temperature issues, of course, check the charge, all that good stuff. Okay. Once you know you have the right amount of refrigerant charge, then you go into each individual coil and you do a temperature check, return to supply, and you compare them. All four coils should be relatively close, but something you need to understand, a TD, there's no like set TD on a refrigerator evaporator. Uh, and, and I mean, temperature differential, not, um, uh, evaporator TD, which is suction saturation versus return air temperature. Okay. It's not that one. I, I should say Delta T is probably what I should say. Okay. So you check the Delta T across the evaporator coil and, you know, typically on something like this, you're going to see five to eight degrees. Okay. It's rare that you're ever going to see 10 degrees. It's going to be five to eight degrees Delta T. And, uh, you start paying attention to that. Um, you, you, uh, look and see where the discrepancies are. You can sometimes assume it's an expansion valve. That's usually going to be your first step is if you're not getting a good Delta T across the coil, you're going to go ahead and replace that expansion valve. Keep in mind, it's if it has a, a strainer on it, you can pump the system down. But on these smaller coils, they typically don't have strainers. And if there is a strainer, it's in the valve, which is just kind of silly, you know, and they're not accessible because most of the time they don't use the, the valves with the removable strainers. So 
just start working your way through that. You see oil related issues, you know, always be prepared for that kind of stuff. So if you're ever trying to unsweat a TXV on one of these coils, like just trying to change the TXV, um, I always recommend pulling the power head, pulling the bottom of the valve apart, just gut the valve inside the box before you unsweat it, because you can get a flame out. You can get a surprise when you're unsweating and all of a sudden all that oil ignites and then woof, you get a little flame. So always try to unbolt the valve, take it apart before you try to unsweat anything and cut out as much as you can. OK, so we ran into an oil log problem. We're always paying attention to that. Um, once we got through that, we worked our way up onto the roof um, and started the evacuation. And again, paying attention when I was uh, or pumping the system down at the beginning of the job. Well, when I went back to change the coils, I noticed that the system was looking like it was overcharged. Now, what happened with that was in between this job, because it was a couple months before the customer approved it, in between the system went low on charge again. They had issues and we had to go out and top off the charge. At that time, I had the service technician that went on site go ahead and change that dual pressure control. I had him change the dual pressure control because that was an easy repair. We knocked that out. So that's why you didn't see the replacement of the dual pressure control in the video. When he did that, he overcharged the system, okay? He made some mistakes. It, it is what it is. It all worked out okay. We had a discussion about it. But when I was pumping it down, you should never see the head pressure go up to 400 PSI. That's a clear sign of an overcharge. Now, it didn't shut off on high pressure, and I did not get it on film. But while I was downstairs changing the evaporator coils, I had another service technician, because I had three people on site, including myself. I had another service technician go up onto the roof and go ahead and recover that refrigerant. And then um, when I went to go charge the system, I still had a lot of refrigerant left in that cylinder. So clearly it was overcharged. Even when I filled it up to the three quarter mark at the very end, there was still refrigerant left in that recovery cylinder. So we were clearly overcharged now that I said that two times. Um, so after that, uh, the system came down to temperature. Uh, since I did this job, it has been it has been a month now, I think, because uh, I'm looking at the date stamps for this video. And it, it was sometime in November, right at the beginning of November when I actually completed the work on this. So. Um, everything's been operating fine, but it's all about taking your time, right? Everybody makes mistakes. We do, but you know, the discussion I had with my technician, the overcharge situation, like that's dangerous. You know, he's putting himself at risk overcharging a situ a system like that. And we don't want to do that. And yes, I understand people get tired. I don't remember the circumstances. It could have been the middle of the night, who knows, but just something to remember whenever I'm on a job, I'm committed to that job. I shut everything else down, okay? I got stuff going on at home. I got craziness. I shut it down. I'm there on that job. The way that I look at things is if I go to work, I'm leaving my baggage at home. Of course, I still think about it, but I'm leaving my baggage at home. I am focused on work. Now, if I can't leave my baggage at home, then I stay home, okay? It, it, bottom line, if I'm not gonna be able to fully focus on work and do my job right, then I'm not gonna go to work. And that's how I view things. I think that's the most important thing we can do is when you go to work, you go to work, okay? Don't do a job half-ass, right? We're there to do it to the best of our abilities within the customer's scope and what they wanna pay for, right? We're there to do it within our abilities. So um, we had a discussion about the overcharge, okay? And, and it happens, you know, it is, everything's fine. It all worked out. We made sure we rectified the situation, but it's always important to check the charge, right? Um, I think that's it on this one. I really, really appreciate you guys making it to the end of this video. Of course, you know, um, I sometimes, especially lately, I've been getting a little worn out and burnout kind of with the YouTube thing. And I'm trying to find my happy place within it. I'm trying to find what's going to work for me because I'm reaching this point where it's starting to get a little bit like, ugh, you know, three straight years of minimum two videos a week three straight actually yeah three straight years of live streams every monday it's starting to get to me so i'm trying to find the way that i want to do things maybe changing something up whatever because i love making these videos it's just the process of sitting down to edit them and uh, i have some mental issues i know i do and when it comes to like knowing that i have to do something like i have a hard time uh planning things out if that makes sense i'm just kind of weird so uh, apologies if uh, quality and stuff like that isn't really the way 
that it has been in the past. I'm still just kind of working through some things, trying to find my happy place. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get things back up to where I feel they should be soon. I'm working on it. Also, I have something really cool that think I think is going to make me I think this kind of happens every year, but I've got something really cool coming up. I think that's going to make me feel a lot better about things. So stay tuned. There'll be a really special video releasing uh, here in the next couple weeks um, where uh, I'm going to do something cool. So stay tuned for that. I really, really appreciate you guys. Remember, I try to do live streams Monday evening, 5 p.m. Pacific on YouTube. Also go live on the HVAC Overtime YouTube channel Friday evenings about 6 or 5 p.m. Pacific with my buddies. Um, there's links in the show notes to all of that. Uh, if you guys haven't already, please check out my website, help to support the channel, hvacrvideos.com merchandise available on there. Um, ways to support the channel. Uh, the easiest way is simply watch the videos from beginning to end, um, without skipping through anything. Uh, if you want to purchase any tools, go to truetechtools.com. Use my offer code, big picture one word as of today, uh, December 4th of 21, you get an 8% discount on checkout. And uh, yeah, uh, Patreon, YouTube channel memberships, PayPal, there's links in the show notes to all of those if you want to help support the channel that way. And uh, yeah, that's it. I will uh, catch you guys on the next one, okay?